Okay, stop the broadcast. We are going. Let's start up the light bulb. Clicking, clack, click and clack. This Peter's clack in this little opening. Oh, the days of typewriters and old style mechanics is not that wonderful. But we're in the 21st century, and here we are. Um, to and WordPress.com, the Troubles in Paradise project, uh, where I'm trying to demolish creationism one source at a time, and uh, having a hell of a lot of fun with it in the process. Uh, so there is our opening thing. I can stop sharing that and. Click close that down to keep my windows going and let's get back to the show here okay so i've got a wonderful uh, special guest today nathan lentz who uh, i came across in my tip research having to do with um uh, the intelligent design movement and now anti-evolutionists light into any scientist that dares conflict with him uh, i'll um uh, put up before i get to that i'm going to put up the material we won't really be talking about because it's what have been the usual thing I've been analyzing the uh, Contested Bones book at the source methods level, which is documenting all the primary sources and tracking them down and so forth and so on. They finally got past the Australopithecines and into Artipithecus, which um, uh, I put up two links to some papers. Remember, my, my practice here, Nathan, is always to put up primary source material that is accessible, open access online so everybody can see it and do their own follow up. So these are a piece and Gibbons from Science, and there's also a, a, a paper, a, a, an analysis that came out in 2010 on it, where the upshot is, the interesting thing about Artipithecus is that it was a biped, and it's showing how broadly ranged bipedality was in the hominid lineage that, that they hadn't really appreciated properly. Well, all the creationists can obsess on is that it's like an ape, it's chimpanzee-like, it's not really a human being, it's not a human ancestor, and that's all they do. So uh, uh, there's a great deal of authority quoting, duh. A uh, great deal of source manipulation, duh. A, a great deal of not really thinking through their model, duh. And I've been doing this now for quite a few weeks, analyzing it uh, at the source methods level. So all of that, the links are in the in the um, a piece, and they can proceed on to that. I also put a link up to the Kent Hovind debate that I did a couple of weeks ago, where I think there was some clock cleaning going on and I was the one cleaning the clocks. So uh, uh, I'm very proud of that one. And that's also applied source methods where I threw him off his game. So I put a link up to that. And uh, so we can now get to the main event, which is the delightful chat we're gonna have with Nathan Lenz. Um, and he can introduce himself and also uh, how he came to appear on my show because of the flat with the Discovery Institute and Michael Egner. <laughs> <laughs> well, hi, it's a, thank you for having me on here. It's certainly a pleasure to, to talk to you and, and to whoever's listening. Um, by way of introduction, um, I'm a molecular biologist by training, uh, but I started reading, writing, blogging, and, and um, analyzing uh, about evolutionary theory about 10 years ago when I realized no one in my department was doing a lot of that, uh, public engagement about science. And it started, um, it started oddly, I don't have to tell that whole story, but um, I you know, took a sabbatical and sort of retrained myself as an evolutionary biologist. Um, and so I, I, now I write and I have research projects in this area now as well. And um, so I didn't have a lot to do with uh, intelligent design or, or any debate or, or interaction with creationists or, or intelligent design proponents. Um, and in fact, until my book came out, I had barely, um, you know, interacted with them at all. Um, of course, I'm aware about them. I've always been aware that they exist and, and, and that they have um, issues with, with uh, modern science. But um, the idea that I put my book out as a way to join and jump into this debate is just not the case. And in fact, uh, if, I, if my book was meant to be a refutation of intelligent design, um, it would have been written very differently. In fact, it would have been more like your book, actually. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and and that's not to say good or bad. I just wasn't writing to that audience. I was writing yeah. to an audience that I assumed had uh, was was within the mainstream um, of evolutionary biology. Um, so I was, you know, if you weren't bought into evolution, I, I I would have watched you the first page of the book. Basically, is what I'm saying. So so they yeah. they came to me. I didn't come to them. I promise. I didn't really want to step in this, but. <laughs> at this point, it seems like I have no choice. Well, yeah, that's the whole point is that um, particularly at the Discovery Institute, which is an apologetic site and also answers in Genesis and to some extent the Institute for Creation Research, they're pathological trawlers. They scavenge around to see if they can find ammunition or, uh oh, there's one of those Darwinists talking about Darwinism again. <laughs> And so you you have a target on you, independent of whether you realized it, merely by virtue of talking about the science and anything that bumps into those issues, darn it all, it's going to come up. 
So uh, welcome to the club. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I don't know what, whether I stand on, um, you know, just going, taking the fight to them and engaging. And I, it, for the most part, I've actually realized that it, it's been nothing but frustration. So I, I don't know. <laughs> I'm feeling a little morose about uh, the whole thing, really. Uh, but, you know, I, I, the fighter in me believes that there's no there's no reason to back down and there's no reason to uh, shy away from this. And um, so, you know, whenever I do have a little bit of time, I engage with it. I tend to get busy. Uh, around this time of year, so I haven't done Doing too much. Doing your lately. darn work, yeah. I, I've noticed yeah. there are quite a few people who they're way too busy to get engaged on this, and I don't blame them. Others are temperamentally not really suited to it because if you bump right. into somebody who is an anti-evolutionist who's literally questioning every assumption that you have built on, and you've moved way past those assumptions to the data field, and you have to suddenly explain the last hundred years of biology to them to get them kind of up to speed, uh, that's something that not every temperament. Wants wants to do and and time is too short to do that. So ideally people like us who are activists and Jackson who's done videos and Pelogia and Aaron Ra, there's a whole slew of people out there who are, are trying to marshal the data field. The thing that's really neat if we can connect up effectively with the scientists is that we've got so much material directly available and accessible that everybody can go and follow up on their own. And so the idea that we have to all do it as just the individual fighting the war, war, a whole fight and having to reinvent the wheel all at once. No, 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 this is 21st century. We got this interconnection stuff. We got social media, we got stupid YouTubes like I'm doing. All of these different ways of connecting people up in such a way that we can find a way that say, hey, that subject that comes up in, in the class, um, check out this website, they'll give you some source material or check out this particular journal, uh, that, uh, and, and that way we can speed up and connect up in a way that we can stay ahead of the creationist instead of just playing catch up to where you only find yeah. out what they're doing when they write a snark about you at Evolution News. Yeah, and they 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 do that. And and the the other thing that I can't I don't think should be lost here is that Evolution News is run by this this uh, group called Discovery Institute, which is also oh, yeah. part of a larger group um, that is a uh, like. On their masthead, their official organizing principle is they are a right wing or at least right leaning political group, um, which means they what brings them together as a group is a political ideology. That is exactly the wrong posture in which to do science because science does not yeah. care about political agenda. It doesn't care about its pure exploration in search of truth. Um, any kind of blinders are really anathema to good science. And that's they bring to the table nothing but blinders. It is they are already fixated on a message that they're trying to put out that has a very clear and specific direction to it. Of course, there's no way there's no way that's that's untrustworthy <laughs> for scientific discourse right off the bat. There's just no way they could be um, trustworthy. And in fact, um, Noam Chomsky has done work. He's not the only one, but he's 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 famously written about how groups of individuals. Um, act differently than than the sum of their parts. So each individual can be an honest person, but they're organized in an association, and he was talking about corporations, um, that starts to take on a life of its own, a property of its own, in service of whatever it is they're there to do. Well, whatever it is this group is here to do is a political ideology focused on, on uh, keeping creationism as an acceptable scientific alternative. That's what brings them together as a group. Fine. We gotta use the terminology correctly. You're absolutely right on that political context. The very yeah. first thing, when I was first bumped into the Discovery Institute way back in the mid 1990s, before Michael Behe had written his uh, book, uh, Darwin's Black Box, he was already posting at the Discovery Institute um, on the why we should privatize social security. This guy right. had a political agenda right from the get go. <laughs> and uh, Bruce Chapman, who helped found the organization, he was a failed governor uh, candidate. Uh, of the, they still push conservative political causes and conservative economics in their various non-anti-evolution posts in there. That's their core group. I allude to it a little bit in uh, the tip 1.7 module at my website where I go into the history of things. From my methods point of view, the thing that troubles me most about the Discovery Institute is how craven they are in not engaging young earth creationism. Almost all of the Discovery Institute gang are not young Earth creationists, uh, with mm -hmm. the exception of Paul Nelson. But they never 
ever under any circumstances ever publicly criticize any young earth creationist dogma. I know Steve Meyer when I talked to him personally when he was up here at Whitworth. He he would engage in personal debates with Dwayne Gish on creationism when he would go to various speeches, but would he ever write about that in any of his public pronouncements? Uh-uh. So be I have been documenting the 100% failure rate of there is no instance anywhere in the intelligent design movement of them ever explicitly even acknowledging the creationism part. The uh, the uh, David Kopech case from the Jet Propulsion Lab, they routinely describe this guy as an intelligent design advocate. He's a young earth creationist wackaloon. This is yeah. this is not this is not a, a design guy. And so uh, uh, that craven aspect of it and that political agenda aspect of it, uh, I had characterized quite independently of everybody else in there. I identified that virtually all anti-evolutionists are culture camp, conservative, religious. It's that nexus. They have a culture war mentality. They're very politically conservative. They range from mainstream conservatism of, of uh, Bruce Chapman all the way out to the Kent Hovian eye twitchy hyper dominionist uh, branch of, uh, of conservatism. There, is, there are virtually never any liberals. Uh, and even in the history of creationism, really the standout figure here is William Jennings Bryan. He stands out like a sore thumb in the anti-evolution brigade as a, a, a progressive leftist anti-evolutionist. And uh, he um, uh, resigned from the um, uh, Wilson administration over uh, uh, pacifism and war issues and the like. But that stands out as something really unusual in the demographic. And so yeah. when I uh, engage on Twitter and others where I find bump, I follow Ann Coulter and Dinesh D'Souza and, uh, uh, and before he got banned, Alex Jones, and I would be engaging with them on what their political views were and what their views on evolution and climate change were, because these are litmus test items. And it's very difficult to find a Trump supporter who is not an anti-evolutionist climate change skeptic. And that's part of that hyper-conservative cultural frame. Mm -hmm. Now, enough uh, of all the flap doodle on intelligent say, design. Bob two, Trivers. Oh, oh, Jackson, do you have a question from the I was audience? gonna say, uh, to your point about the uh you know deciding making up your mind before it starts every website or every website owned by you know creationists intelligent designers they all have essentially the same creed which is that we can't be wrong no matter the evidence and answers in genesis literally says that they say oh, yeah. no evidence that disagrees you know with the, the scripture can be considered valid there's a litmus test there uh, to uh, uh, get into Ken Ham's bunch, to get at Liberty University, any of these networks. Uh, they have a set of non-negotiable uh, 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 non dogmas, and that's why they're actually useful in pegging who a lot of these people are. Because if somebody has published an article overtly at Institute for Creation Research or Answers in Genesis, excuse me, they're a young earth creationist because they don't publish stuff by people who aren't. So you can use that as a filtration mechanism. One of the pending books that I have down the line is a full court press analysis of the Discovery Institute's uh, Descent from Darwin list. There's been a little bit of stuff on it, Irrational Wiki, but what I wanna go through is a complete investigation of who's on it, what their CVs are, what uh, works they have done, and try to figure out what's going on. Because from what I can see so far, uh, one of the anal retentive things I do in my tip project is I keep track of the scientists actually doing the technical papers and as well as the anti-evolution field. So I've got about 2,300 anti-evolutionists in my data field at the moment and something on the order of 60,000 uh, scientists, including you, uh, that's on the people doing uh, the technical literature. And so I can measure where the anti-evolutionists are on that data field and how prominent a player they are. And it's been the case all the way from the get-go that the even ones that are high up in the science food chain, they're, they're interlopers. They're not high up on biological food chain. They may be a very well-known physicist or somebody in that range, a tour who is a, a chemist, and they have their religious dogma, but they're not really big players. If Eugene Coonan suddenly turns into an intelligent design advocate, then holy smokes, that's the news bulletin, but not, uh, not Jonathan Wells. <laughs> Right, right, and it's a it's a point that I made um, as well is that um, the, it's a striking lack of credentials um, in biology uh, in that crew. There is almost no one um, who would meet the standard that most of us would hold for a active contributing scientist in their yeah. field uh, in, in biology specifically. You have some MDs, 
who don't get that much science education. I'm, I'm sorry to burst everyone's yeah, bubble. That's, about that, that's quite no. true. <laughs> um, and uh, there's some MDs, there's some, as you said, physicists, engineers, that kind of thing. But there's almost nobody who, who has gone through like the tenure track, for example, uh, in a biology department. It's well, even just, the ones who do are crap at it. Look at Georgia Purdom. Yeah, I don't she's even a, know who that is. Oh, Georgia Purdom. Oh, she's with Answers the, in Genesis. Yeah, she yeah. has a, a PhD in genetics, and yet she utterly flops when it comes to talking about mutations. Yeah, utterly. and some genuine publications. Uh, Jeffrey Tompkins is another one we'll be taking on. He's a geneticist, a lower level one, uh, at the University of Georgia. He's one of the main point men at Answers in Genesis and ICR on disputing the chromosome 2 fusion. He's one of their heavy guns in that respect. And there hasn't been nearly, oh yeah, yeah, you hang your head, in, yeah, yeah, not that again. Yeah, yeah uh, and I it's mean, fascinating to, to look at. Uh, Michael Denton is one of the peculiar outliers here because uh, he's a biochemist like Michael Behe, uh, mm -hmm. He's an agnostic, so he doesn't have the religious perspective. But as I did in, in my uh, Evolution Slam Dunk book, oh, shameless plug. Da, 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 there's my book. Um, mm -hmm. The um, uh, Michael Denton makes the same class of mistakes that a Kent Hovind does uh, down at the bottom feeder level. He relies on secondary sources. He's very superficial in his research. He often relies on older material. He authority quotes. In one case, is in literally his entire evidence that there were no feathered dinosaurs consists of a posting from Casey Luskin at Evolution News. That was it. That was his one source. And he never bothered to fact check it either. So this, this underneath that, that abject thing, the other area that I'm fascinated with is the lack of paleontologists. There hasn't no, been an anti-evolutionist paleontologist of note in a hundred years. Yeah. It's just not <laughs> and you've got a few. Kurt Wise has paleontology degrees. You've got a bunch of people at the Loma Linda Adventist University that do some paleontology work once in a while. Uh, you've got Gunter Beckley, who apparently just became a Roman Catholic, and now he's jumped on to the intelligent design bandwagon. But as soon as he goes into apologetics mode, he's doing the same thing Jonathan Wells is doing. He's saying pot shot, pot shot, pot shot, but we don't know what he thinks happened even with the insects, which are his main field. No, it's it's a fascinating behavioral trait, uh, which um, is is worthy of interest to look into for the how belief systems override the data field. Uh, you've got some people like the honest creationist, Todd Wood, who accepts that there's evidence for evolution. He says he's not a theory in crisis and, and Darwin was a perfectly legitimate scientist, but he can't believe what he sees because he's a young earth creationist doctrinally. So he's an honest creationist. And I'm always waiting, will there be some epiphany moment when suddenly Todd Wood is gonna have the light bulb go off and, and realize that he needs to change the thing, but he could go to the end of his days. The number of Upper echelon anti-evolutionists who have ever changed their minds is really limited. You right. find lower echelon ones who change their mind. And typically, they are ones who were raised in it. So they don't have that Tortukan mindset that I would be talking about. They were simply raised in it as what was their world. And then they get out in the big world and they discovered all the stuff they didn't know. And that's when they just discard the old model because it doesn't make any sense anymore. Mm -hmm. So Bob Trivers, you said you had you were doing some new research with Bob Trivers. Uh, do a brief intro of, of, of his interaction with you and what you're engaged in, because now, sorry, gang, we're going to leave the creationism issue and actually talk science. <laughs> well, um, I don't. So Bob is um, he's bounced around a little bit lately, but we've been in contact for a few years and, um, you know, so I bounced ideas off of him and, and he's he's always working on stuff sort of in his head um, and he's been working on um, a manuscript on the uh, evolutionary genetics of honor killings um, he's done that he's been working on that for a few years and it's come he's given a few lectures so I think he's publicly presented his thesis now um, he just hasn't written it all up and he's looking for a publisher and I'm, I'm helping him with that um, but it's really interesting work because honor killing uh, from an evolutionary point of view seems so incredibly anti-Darwinian in terms of uh, mm -hmm. increasing one's fitness um, while killing killing your own child, and he's specifically looking at parents uh, killing uh, fathers killing their daughters, but also uh, occasionally uh, other configurations of that, because it seems like it would there there could be nothing you would do that would re reduce your fitness more than that. Um, but actually, he he analyzed the different populations in which you find honor killings throughout the world. Um, both contemporary and then he looked at cultures that really aren't that way anymore. So for example, um, 
uh, Jewish communities, not not contemporary, but in, in um, way it's sort of not biblical times either, but sort of let's say early um, in, during the classical period. Let's say that. So you have that. You have two tribes in Africa. That period. Yeah, yeah, South Asia, and of course you have it um, um, in the Islamic world now. And he found that the one thing that really connects all of these communities is a high degree of intermarriage within families, so a high degree of inbreeding. Ooh. And what and what happens is when you have a high degree of inbreeding, the amount of relatedness that you have among cousins is much higher than would be predicted by standard math. So if two unmarried people, um, and you take two unmarried people two generations out, then cousins, you know, should should share eight and a half percent DNA. But that actually is much higher when you have a lot of intermarriage and interbreeding. Um, wow. And so, so I got a new fitness. example for him. Okay, so there you uh, go. Romans. And, 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 yeah, exactly. And I, he might even have Romans in there. I can't remember. Yeah, you, the, the 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 Roman. I was thinking because you have the the whole culture of honor and how you have um, the dueling culture that eventually filters all the way into the United States and on yes. into gang warfare today. Uh, mm -hmm. That uh, all stems back to the kind of Roman, don't matter what you do in private, it's what you are perceived to do in public. Well, the ruling mm -hmm. class of the Roman Empire, particularly in the Julio-Claudians, is a positive intermesh of intermarriage. Mm -hmm. It's it's people right. when somebody dies, they marry the wife off to one of the cousins, and it's just a thicket of interrelationship from uh, Julius Caesar all the way down to when Nero bumps off half of the family to get rid of all the rivals. So that would be an example that he might want to take a look at as a, as a t case yeah. test study of the, of the Roman yeah, usage of this. I'll take a look at that in the manuscript. But the point being though, is that if you are, if your nieces and nephews are at, at this, as the same degree of relatedness to you as your own children, potentially, um, then you know it starts to make a little bit more sense that 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 killing one person to preserve the honor of say fifteen or twenty cousins, uh, your fitness level actually does go up uh, in, mm -hmm. in the calculations. And so, well, he's in the mimetic sense about the dynamic of the culture, where mm -hmm. you're uh, there. Were, one of the things that struck me about the dueling culture was the difference between the way a southerner perceived honor and the way in which uh, a, a de Tocqueville or a Ben Franklin did, because they both commented mm -hmm. on the weirdness of it. Yeah. If, if uh, somebody told you that your wife looked ugly, uh, a Yankee would say, well, poop on you. I don't care what you think about my wife. I think she's beautiful. And that would be the mm -hmm. end of it. But for a Southerner, they have now been insulted. And it is independent of whether the, uh, the wife is hideous or not. It's that she must not be deemed to be so in the public context. But then this mm -hmm. becomes a social networking thing because mm -hmm. it was impossible for a duel to occur unless the two participants were at the same social strata. You could not be insulted by an inferior. So an inferior might insult you. You would not have a duel with them because they're at the lower pecking order. So there's this complex structure. Another one that you might wanna look at too is the Spanish because they had such an incredibly complicated system of gradations of relatedness where mm -hmm. if somebody was a, a born a, a two um, uh, people who are pure blood Spanish uh, and they have a child in Madrid and then at some point the family moves to Mexico City where he becomes a governor and they have a second child. That second child is socially inferior to the one who was born in Madrid. That kind of complex pecking order that occurs in that social framework, I would imagine would be connecting up at a, at a social nexus level independent of the genes. Yeah, but it, it could feed back in the genes too because social level, traditionally speaking anyway, has always seemed to be directly or, or directly influential of fitness. And mm -hmm. so this does circle back. It really is, it is related. So it, it's one of these areas where cultural, bio, cultural evolution and biological evolution are, are inter, intermixed there. And, yeah. and when the genetics works out, as it really seems to, uh, by, by his calculations, and, I, and this is not, I'm not involved in the work, I've just been sort of, mm -hmm. um, I've been encouraging him and, and reading, reading drafts. It'd be fun um, to see whether there is a similar dynamic going on in um, social cover-upping and um, uh, ostracism and so forth in the whole Victorian thing, because that, by, by the time you hit the late 19th century, you have a gigantic intermarried 
nexus of, of monarchy where everybody is related to the point of hemophilia uh, mm -hmm. with uh, Queen Victoria. So mm -hmm. uh, theoretically, that would be another test case to find out are these same dynamics showing up perhaps in disguised ways in that 19th century culture. And you'd have the advantage of a huge amount of documentation potentially available on that as opposed to the Romans where exit yeah. Suetonius and you're up right, the creek. Right. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. Um, the other thing that we're working on right now, so he's he's had um, an interest in homosexuality specifically, but also just sex in general, uh, the evolutionary genetics of sex. And I've, I've been proposing and trying to, to get off the ground a book about se uh, sexuality and human sexuality in the evolutionary context. And so he and I are sort of comparing notes right now to see if we might actually write this book together. Um, mm -hmm. it, it could even have some new information, like new, it might have some new analysis. Um, we'll see, we'll see if it takes shape, but, um, trying to keep, because basically our, our thesis here is that most of the ways in which human beings now approach sex and, and, and sexuality has been in the context of social constructs that are not biologically ingrained by any means. So that's the context of marriage. That's the context of other transactional approaches. And none of that was really part of our past and it doesn't have perfect parallels with other creatures. And even in my own writing, I have this tendency to compare human and animal behavior with religion and things. And actually that might be the wrong way to do it. We might be, um, instead of comparing mod our modern approach to relationships, we can, can consider what our relationship was in, in, in sexual specifically you know, sort of pre pre agriculture, let's say, um, mm. or even before that, might be much more closely to sort of how we were geared. And and, and 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 if we're correct, it does explain the really hyper um, hyper way that we all view sex. It's not just so we all know that religion, especially especially uh, Abrahamic religions, have a really toxic relationship to sex. I mean, they they just can't deal with it in any way, <laughs> in any reasonable way. But it's not just them. I mean, we find people who have long been freed um, from some of that kind of thinking who still have a very strange. It seems like we don't we don't really have a healthy relationship with sex in our mm -hmm. in our culture. Well, look at the Hindus and their weird obsessions with seminal discharge. Yeah, there, there's all it, sorts. It, of, they didn't quite understand what was going on with the biology. And they could right. tell that when males and females did stuff that they ended up with children, but mm -hmm. there was so little science going on. I was flabbergasted to discover that it literally wasn't until like about 1860 that they pinned down that sperm was involved in the fertilization mm -hmm. of eggs. <laughs> Wow, I did not know that. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, that they 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 had thought of a uh, prior to that time they would see in their microscopes. They knew that there was something happening with semen, but they yeah. were seeing these wiggly things going on there. They thought they were like parasites that had nothing to do with the with the phenomenon. And it wasn't until the 1860s or so that it finally dawned on them that this was actually the thing that fertilized the egg. Uh, hmm. I put some references on that in the uh, section. It came up with the biogenesis issue and Louis Pasteur and stuff in uh, uh, a tip 1.7 again. Hey, everybody download hmm. that. You'll find a lot of shit. 1.7. <laughs> yeah. But the, what we're, but basically our thesis is that part of why we have such an unhealthy relationship with sex. I mean, really since, since at least classical period, if not back to uh, um, pre agriculture days is because we forced it into these weird social constructs in which it was it was never made to flourish. But what's interesting is right now, socially, you have these movement, first of all, of no labels. I don't know how well you're aware of this no labels movement. So it's about, mm. it's refusing, young people right now are sort of refusing to pin themselves down as either fully heterosexual, fully homosexual. They're just sort of pansexual, whatever. And everyone just thinks of it as woo woo young kids. But actually they're probably much closer to how sexuality was approached a long time ago. But if you marry that also with the very low marriage rates among young people, people are sort of realizing that marriage was this uh, this construct, um, at least monogamy anyway, is this construct. And so you put all these together and our thesis is sort of like we're actually rediscovering um, a, a healthier relationship with sex and sexuality. And with some of his work on homosexuality that he's never published before, I think brings some of this full circle. So we'll 
Another mm -hmm. cultural frame that you want to may want to look at are Native Americans because I understand that they have a much more tolerant aspect about uh, a gender identity than you find in the European related cultures. So that would be right. another test bed to look at the different dynamics that was going on there. Uh, and of course, you got the 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 wonderful hypocrisy aspect of the uh, Hellenistic world and the Romans, where mm -hmm. they their boys will be boys. You can have your gay relationship, and then you settle down, and you have mm -hmm. one wife monogamously, and that's mm -hmm. what goes on the thing. But go ahead, you can have as many affairs as you want, just as long as no one knows about it. Yeah, so I mean, even even by their own standards, nobody really was was following this construct that was so important to them. <laughs> um, yeah, and, yeah. Well, hi hypocrisy is is a highly Tortucan trait. It shows yeah. up in religion and politics and systems that tolerate that level of hypocrisy. But remember that Tortucan mind concept, it's that their brain literally doesn't notice the contradiction. But they right. can have a compartment over here and a compartment over there, and they just don't compare the two in the same mm -hmm. way that Kent Hovian doesn't match up speciation phenomenon with the reptile mammal transition. It's just no dot connecting is going on. I'm about halfway through the show, so I must pause briefly for my obligatory um, um, shameless plug and thanking all the tape patrons. Uh, this will just take a short while, and RJ goes through his terrible ritual of having to screen share again. And then the infinite regress, blah, 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 and so forth and so on. Anyway, there's my uh, tip patrons, Stephen and Marigail and Keith and Dyer and Andrew and Eat and Yui and Mona and Hendrel and Jen and Jody and Daniel and Ralph and Bo Hobo and Eric and Benjamin and Staggles and Alex and Surus, who's helping me do the um, audio book for uh, the Paralogs of Fog novel, and uh, Totes Real and Everett Vincent and Paul Williams. Thank you all. And there's my website. If you don't have this on your damn PC or your smartphone, why the hell not? And uh, there's the Patreon site, although I have to point out that they're slow as molasses for getting money to me. So maybe, you know, just perfunctory thing there. But if you really want to help the project, GoFundMe.com, DCGo, where I actually get the scratch after a couple of days, which is often very important to like pay bills and eat and do the things that go on. So there's my obligatory um, uh, um, shout out for the project. And I got links to all that naturally in the main sheet so everybody can follow up on that thing. So yeah, uh, back to the wonderful world of, of the, the science thing. The thing that I, uh, to kind of connect it back up to that creationism issue is that homosexuality and sexuality issue, that is a third rail for the Discovery Institute. There are some people there that go ballistic uh, of, of Wesley and West and others. They're constantly diatribing on that transgender thing and American human exceptionalism. Yeah, yeah uh, jump in Jackson. Oh, you know, it ain't natural to be gay, except that other organisms display homosexual tendencies, but irrelevant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll just oh, do a fact a check here with, anyways, with Nathan. So. My understanding is that at least on human sexuality, that there is a good circumstantial argument to be made that some of the things that contribute to male homosexuality can be passed along the female line. That's why you can have the nephew being gay. And so you have a heterosexual mechanism that is putting those into the field. And then, of course, you start looking at the social dynamic of do such communities actually thrive better when they have that genetic mix? And that's why it consists in the population. Over on the lesbian side, I think that it's been much harder to be able to identify the genes that are involved in that. And so the, the prospect is that there might be two differential systems in play that they haven't been able to identify quite so easily. yet. Would that be a good summary of where the literature is at the moment? Yes. If you were to look at the attempts for, uh, for male heterosexual or homosexuality specifically, there does seem to be a matrilineal uh, inheritance pattern. Um, it, it's not, it's not super strong, but it's definitely yeah. above statistical noise. And you do find, um, that the matrilineal inheritance of homosexuality correlates well with increased fecundity or fertility, um, however you want to view it. Um, and so the male, the females that ha that share this genetic element with their homosexual male relatives seem to be more fertile and more, pro more prolific. Um, and this this fits nicely with this notion we have of the gay uncles doting on their nieces and nephews, and they're more numerous because of the females yeah. having more children. I mean, it's that that seems a little too neat for me, but there's definitely some evidence that there appears to be uh, an increase in fertility associated with the same genetic elements. At one point, we thought we had it pinned down on the X chromosome. That seems not to have held up uh, to, a, to a locus on the X chromosome, mm -hmm. but we're, I mean, I think people are still looking. But I have to say there's a little bit of... I have a little bit of reservations to read about reading too much into this because I think that we tend to want to think as simplistically with the genetics rather than seeing attraction as largely cultural and, and social environmental 
And some of these things can just be probabilistic without being purely genetic. Well, or lots of genes are involved. I don't exactly, think sexuality exactly. is so something that's caused by the gene. It's right, a very yeah. so, network of things of which there are mm -hmm. little iceberg tips that we're seeing up at the genetic level. Yeah, and so in fact, Carl Zimmer, in, in, in his new book, Carl Zimmer rails against the, known, the, the very notion of there's a gene for this. There's not a gene for anything. Everything is yeah. multigenic. Everything is, is polygenic. Um, you would have so, thought once they found out about alternative splicing and the fact that we have only a quarter as many genes as we have proteins, that should have been like, duh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So these things are complicated, especially, uh, as I said, within the, the cultural milieu. So if you think of attraction as this very probabilistic function that takes shape in a cultural milieu, it's perfect. It could perfectly handle a ratio of, say, nine to one heterosexual to homosexual with with no genetic difference. Re required to do that. So I think I think the search for a genetic explanation was born out of our desire for there to be a genetic explanation. <laughs> um, but I don't know that it's going to match. I, I don't know. I think the jury's still out there. But um, but the interesting thing is that attraction uh, seems to set in uh, with environmental um, cues fairly early in life. And so you have latent sexual attraction. Uh, so in other words, Freud was right. Uh, he was just <laughs> wrong about the some of the details. Well, and even those little MHC molecules that play yeah, a role well, in exactly, sexual attraction. Exactly, and that's all in that mix too. So we, we seem to be, as children, very sensitive to, okay, we're not going to be attracted to close relatives, but we are going to be attracted to, to mid-level relatives, you know, sort of cousins. And, and uh, so, so we're attracted to what we see, but not to what we see every day. <laughs> so it, you know, it have this idea. We don't want too much inbreeding, but we do have. We do want to favor our own, our in group. Um, and that, then that does... the, the technological mix. Uh, that I I can't imagine that there wasn't an enormous impact on that genetic process when railroads were invented, and suddenly mm -hmm. people would be breeding with people who were living wow a hundred miles away, and yeah. now it even alters uh, as a ridiculous example. What will be the effect upon mating of the fact that we now have routinely in automobiles bucket seats with a center console and a gear shift? There's no front seat canoodling anymore. So you've got a different selection pressure for mating factors where either you got to do it in the back seat or do something other than that. That <laughs> will have an effect. Well, it didn't come, it didn't come up today. <laughs> <laughs> Anything's possible. <laughs> yeah, well, those are the kinds of weird little circumstances for the same reason that uh, the polio epidemic, from my understanding of it, occurred because of the cleanliness efforts in the early 20th century that got rid of measles. Measles were inadvertently inoculating people against the, uh, the uh, 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 polio virus. So cleanliness was actually producing a, an unintended side effect. Yeah, well, it still is. I think... Uh... Cleanliness is leading towards the, the, the big boost in, in uh, allergies, food allergies, especially. Oh, yeah. yeah, a little bit of dirt's a good thing. Yeah, no, that's how I'm, I'm raising my kids dirty. <laughs> and you'd have to, and if we ever have uh, space arcs and the like, you'd have to take a lot of that dirt and crud and stuff with you. Otherwise, your immune system never gets acclimated. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, they're, they, they're studying the microbiome of plants in space right now, because if we're ever going to plant crops in the space station or whatever, mm -hmm. they're not going to have their microbiome either if we're not careful. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. The, the it, it's it's a useful feedback mechanism here is to try to figure out what actually is involved in, in the necessity of stuff. Uh, just the thing that just popped up in relation to the flooding with the hurricanes, uh, and uh, that doesn't even involve a biological system, that initially they were thinking in terms of global warming causing an increase in the number of hurricanes or in, an increase in the intensity of, of hurricanes. Well, it turns out those actually aren't the problem. It's that hurricanes aren't stronger or more frequent. What they are is slower. So mm -hmm. the same hurricane is coming in and just staying there and staying there and staying there. And it's putting all of the rain in one localized area that's more than the rivers can handle. And so you end up with much more severe local flooding because of the slowness of the process rather than that. So you always have to look at how things actually play out to go, ah, ah we didn't think about that. Well, yeah, but you can also imagine that um, with with hurricanes, a big problem is a storm surge. If you have a, a, a storm pressing down the ocean, especially at high tide, um, you can have an incredible storm surge. And if you're adding another foot and a half to that because of rising sea levels, yeah. I mean, a foot and a half is a huge difference in terms of... Oh, every cubic meter of water weighs a ton. Mm -hmm. Right. 
And when all you have to have is a few extra cubic meters bearing down on you, and you discover that that's not a good thing. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, we're seeing all the results of that and now. That's, and that's just in relation to a completely physical system. Uh, and again, it's no coincidence to connect back up to the Intelligent Design uh, Brigade that um, a climate change skepticism is one of the endemic features of anti-evolutionism. It's been the case all the way mm -hmm. back in Jerry Falwell's time. There was always an anti-environmentalism to it. And they're using exactly the same method. There's a terrible amount of cherry picking. There's over-reliance on old sources. I bump into this all the time. I come like Dinesh D'Souza, who claims to be okay with evolution, although it's hard to pin him down as to what the hell he means by it. But he's a secondary source added climate uh, skeptic. And then Coulter, uh, the great harpy of our time, uh, she um, uh, is both an anti-Darwiniac and also a climate change skeptic. And it's all because she relies on secondary sources. Uh, she relied on Bill Dembski for her evolution material. That's a dangerous daisy chain. And so that, that methods issue, you have to look deeper uh, at the cognitive structure. If uh, I'd love to get connected, and maybe you can help me do this with some neuroscientists to try to tease out whether or not this little Tortukan concept that I have has actual validity to it or not. I suspect it has a connection with the anterior cingulate cortex that's involved in self-deception. Uh, there's probably multiple brain systems that's going on. But the reason why it's kind of different is I think previously, if you just went out and did a study where you would ask people what they think on a variety of topics and you ask them if they think the earth is flat and so many people say the earth is flat and most people don't, and you would look at their brains to see what's different between the two, you're going to be thrown off because the same mechanism that permits the flat earther to believe in the flat earth may be operating in the people that don't think the earth is flat. Kent Hovind doesn't think the earth is flat, but he's just the same bad method. And people who think the earth is a globe may still have this property. So teasing out what these dynamics are at the brain uh, interaction level is not so easy as just looking at a data field. Yeah. And well, and I have to say that I, um, to a certain extent, I guess I can understand if you have a very biblical view of the world, why evolution would be threatening for that. I, I mean, I can understand that just on principle. What I can understand is how that connects to the anti-environmentalism anti and their resistance to climate change. Because, I mean, I, I forget, there's some comedian put it this way, like, if you really think that, that God created the world for you, wouldn't you be expected to take care of it and, and keep well, it? And there is, in fact, a, a very great evangelical <laughs> environmental movement. But yeah. most evangelicals are not young earth creationists. They are not in that culture camp framework. When you look back at the at the cultural matrix uh, that generated the Jerry Falwells and still does with Tony Perkins and Reverend Dobson and uh, the people that are the grassroots that lead to the Mike Pence's and the Mike Huckabee's and all that, uh, that has a, a hyper pro business uh, cultural conservatism. So if the if the Heartland Institute says there's a problem with uh, uh, that and it's funded by the good old boys that they golf with on the golf course, that's how that network siphons together. There's a uh, an old style big business pro industry anti leftist weird ball environmentalism thing. These are the tropes that they play off of. Even to this day, they seem to be the, under the impression that all climate scientists are left wingers. No, that's not true. There's, no, it's there's not. perfectly conservative ones, but they don't perceive it that way. They view it as a left, right, good, bad. This, this is what God. I'm getting at is that, is that right. I know that they really do believe what they, about, I mean, because mm -hmm. if you look at like Huckabee, for example, I mean, he has grandchildren and you he must truly believe that this climate change stuff is nonsense because how could he look his grandchildren in the eye if he's, yeah. you know, doing what he's doing? And, so, and connect the dots here. Mike Huckabee is a young earth creationist, so his brain has the ability to believe something which is factually preposterous, but yet he firmly convinced it's true. And his daughter is the press uh, spokesman for Donald Trump. Connecting some dots here? <laughs> you have a, a way of looking at the world that's not necessarily inherited genetically, but it is culturally. So there's a series of tropes, there's a series of defense mechanisms, there's a series of modalities that pop up. And what I'm trying to do in my tip project, and Jackson can weigh in on it as well, he's a source methods guy. You were doing source methods when you went after Egner, you were looking up the primary sources, you were pointing out that he doesn't seem to understand the data field, um, that uh, Pelogia, and there's a whole bunch of people that are that are functionally moving in that source methods direction. 
the, the bigger picture that I want to see is where reporters are using it. They're not asking methods questions uh, nearly enough. They're asking political, philosophical mm -hmm. questions, or maybe some data field questions. They're not talking about where are you getting your information from? How are you fact checking that information? How can you be sure that it means what you want it to? Those source methods questions are where they're really screwing up. And the more we get a social network where that becomes normal to where the idea that, that you still might get a young earth creationist elected office. There's very politically conservative districts in Montana. The guy that just got elected up in there was that. Uh, and that probably is not going to change. But nobody should be able to make it through the electoral process or the nomination process without that information at least being known. Because mm -hmm. look at the number of people that got on the Dover School Board who were stealth. They didn't know what they were. And afterwards, when it all blew up in their face, then they got tossed out. But you, it's better to weed that out before they get on the board, not afterward. <laughs> yeah, this, this is this. Uh, we'd like to. Some people would like to keep it separate from politics and cultural issues and that. But unfortunately, they won't let us. That the worldview of Tony Perkins uh, and the Family Research Council uh, and their continual relentless drumbeat, Jay Sekulow from Pat Robertson's uh, uh, ACLJ, he's the personal lawyer for President Trump now. There is a network of interconnections that's going on that we ignore where they're coming from and their worldview and their methodology to our peril. Yeah, I agree with that. I, I would never have thought that the study of evolution um, would would become so politicized, but it, it did, and, and and like you said, we can try to ignore it and just stick to the science. But yeah. that's bringing a knife to a gunfight because they absolutely connect all of this stuff together. They use their political mm -hmm. power to destroy or to, to attempt to destroy the science and science education. So, yeah, like you said, we ignore that at, at our own peril. And although uh, but, your 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 intelligent design crowd, the, the Egners and the Jonathan Wells, they're a, a minority group. They're they're very vocal and well funded. But when I'm looking at how anti actual anti-evolutionists function at the grassroots and who they're paying attention to, I'm way more likely to bump into somebody that, that talks about Dr. Kent Hovind than they do uh, Michael Behe's Irreducible Complexity. Uh, right. And so the, the actual grassroots effect of this, everything is affected by young earth creationism. One of the things that the, uh, I've been waiting for for years is that very few young earth creationists are Egyptologists. And so they didn't notice that Egypt doesn't have a flood legend. In fact, they were busily building pyramids at the same time that the big slosh was supposedly occurring. And I was just sitting back waiting, how long before somebody notices that? And now you have some of the ones in the Young Earth Creationist movement that finally the little gas lamp went off and they're actually figuring out, they're trying to put rollers under the Egyptian culture because they have to move all of Egyptian history, not just the pyramid age, but the whole shebang down past 2350 BC to bring it in after the flood because they cannot be reconciled with flood dogma without that. So there's a mass of science where anybody trying to do their work, anybody doing any ethnobiology, any study of linguistics outside of the Indo-Europeans when they're talking about what's going on with crop domestication in Mesoamerica or yeah. the role of what's uh, the cultural uh, development in um, uh, Australia by the Aborigines for tens of thousands of years before Europeans showed up. That's all on the target list in principle with young earth creationism. There, there, there's almost no discipline that won't be screwed up if these people can get to the stage where they can start impacting stuff and they yeah. would like to do that. Yeah, I mean, what we really see, and, and I think I never put that final point on it, but you talked about their addiction to secondary sources. Um, but what you're seeing is that's part of a larger pattern of just simply contempt for expertise, right? The, the idea that somebody can be an expert in something because they've worked in it and, and, and observed from themselves, they're contemptuous of that whole thing. Jackson's got a point. Okay. In the chapter, the white chapter, we did a chapter on A.J. Monty White for the Answers book, and he holds a degree in chemistry, uh, a Ph.D., and he got his like, Ph.D. in gas kinetics. And so he did a section in his chapter on the, the Miller-Urey experiment, which we all know long outdated, but creationists want to smash it to pieces anyways, because why not? But mm -hmm. instead of actually using his own expertise of chemistry, he, he relies on who does not have a degree in chemistry. He has a degree in human biology. And so 
I just thought that that was very bizarre that oh, instead yes. of using I'll his own you degree, he uses someone else's. Nathan. In my tip project, I have I, I said I tracked 2,300 anti-evolutionists so far. That generates about 8,800 sources, and that's against the data field of 25,000 technical papers. 95% of the anti-evolutionists do not cite primary sources. And of the ones who do, um, a big chunk of them are just citing sources secondarily that they copied from somebody else, like uh, Mike Riddle was doing with the Taylor Southon paper that he on radiometric dating of diamonds that he got from uh, Andrew Snelling. And that was a fun twice chat. Twice we confirm I, we, when we were just talking with him just earlier this year, we confirmed that he has never bothered to read the original paper. What bloody laziness! It's absolutely appalling. So what you end up with? I'll, I'll ask a delicious question to Nathan. Can you guess how many actual fact claimants the anti, and the entire anti-evolution movement currently are the ones that actually make science fact claims that everybody else relies on? Stab a number. I'm sure it's very small. Um, <laughs> um, I would say it's got to be less than a dozen. Well, actually, it's slightly bigger than that. It's fifty. But, uh, but in the intelligent design community, you're actually right. There's only about a dozen intelligent design advocates, and then the remaining three quarters of them are young earth creationists like that Jeffrey Tompkins and Georgia Purdom and all the rest. So what we're trying to do, what I'm trying to do in the TIP project and drag in by the tendrils more and more people to pay attention to this is uh, to really go after the heavy guns the top ones to deal with, there's a lot of bottom feeding going on and Kent Hovind is an influential bottom feeder, but these upper echelon ones, you wanna to get to. So you can knock the props out from under their top core and everything down the line cascades away from it. That's the plan. <laughs> so I don't know, have you met Kent Hovind? Cause I have to say, I'd never heard that. Oh, yeah. name We've both well, by, talked to uh, him. My phone. I bumped yeah. into him uh, way back in the Dynomania, my chapter at TIP, will give you, fill you in on some of the back details, um, that uh, uh, I bumped into him in the 1990s when my brother had seen this creationist tape that one of his creationist friends had seen, and it was a Kent Hovind tape. Nobody knew who the hell Kent Hovind was in the 1990s. He was extremely unknown. And uh, he gave it to me, my brother gave it to me to, to fact that, and I tracked down his address and wrote a letter to him. This was before the internet and uh, was quizzing him on stuff. And in fact, I alluded to it in my um, uh, debate with him I just had a couple weeks ago. Uh, and um, he called me, he loves to chat, he loves to do direct lecturing. He doesn't write much because he can't spell very well. So this is not his forte, he likes to talk. He doesn't and, pronounce uh, words well either. <laughs> no, no, he, well, he says, I don't use all those big words. And I yeah. can guarantee you, yes, that is something that Kent Hovind is never going to be accused of using. He trips <laughs> over his own stuff just hilariously. But the thing is, is that Kent was a very effective evangelist. He was able to go oh, yeah. all over the country for decades and do these things largely because he wasn't doing withholding for his employees. So he was, that's what landed him in jail. Yeah. Uh, so he could, he could squeeze his money out very much more. And he's he's a, somebody that's not even regarded as a, a, a good guy from the creationist point of view. Right. Like Wayland right. and others have criticized, Sarfati have criticized uh, uh, Kent on his uh, uh, biblical scholarship and on his factual yeah, data. He, I mean, he's, he just, he's just persona non grata. And yet yeah, he, there he are makes things millions. up just on the fly. Oh, oh, oh. well, he he let's put it this way. He riffs very busily. <laughs> and so the example that I did in my debate with him, he made a disastrous mistake just a couple weeks ago. He relied on Harun Yahya, the idiot Muslim uh, anti-evolutionist who basically siphoned stuff off the intelligent design community. And he copied it verbatim, page by page by page for his PowerPoint on the discussion of uh, Archaeoraptor uh, case in Alan Fiducia and others and feather evolution. And so he was totally dependent Young Earth creationist Kent Hovind is dependent on Wackaloon Harun Yahya, who copies material parasitically that he got from other anti-evolution sites and buffs it up. It literally didn't occur to Kent to even look up what terms were or to read the original papers, all of which were available online. It was just absolute absurdity. This is independent of what religion he has. It's independent of his politics. Anybody who is that incompetent at the scholarly level level gets an F on their paper no matter what. Right. And he did not like that. <laughs> well, you know, it's funny. I, I, until this week, I'd never heard the name Kent Hovind before. But you and somebody else commented on my blog a few days ago that he had been reading from my blog on his video. 
Um, mm-hmm. and so I was like, who is this Kent Hovind guy? And I'm using I, the term reading loosely, I'm assuming. Yeah, he was Mr. Yeah, and, and it's Hogan. Words. His but, son, um, Eric, while daddy was in jail, his son, Eric, kind of branched off on his own. And he uh, is is kind of sort of, he's still young earth creationist, but he's not a daddy Easter. He's moved himself away from it, and he's become a parasite of the Answers in Genesis in ICR crowd. So he'll have Andrew Snelling, and he'll have Georgia Purdom and various other people on his program. And he does a glossy little video, way more sophisticated, frankly, than what uh, Kent does on his shtick. So you have fissioning going on in the same way that Answers in Genesis fissioned about, oh, yikes, 1990s or so. They had a schism where uh, a bunch of the various people in there didn't like how uh, Ken Ham was running the organization, so they split off, and they and like Solomon, they divided the baby. So all the old technical literature from the various uh, uh, Answers in Genesis journals, half of it went over to Creation Ministries International, which is the non-Ken uh, uh, Ken Ham branch, and then all the official stuff still over Answers Research Journal and stuff like that is over at Answers in Genesis. So um, they've got kind of a separation thing. So older material that used to be labeled as just Answers in Genesis is actually showing up on the CMI website rather than that. I see. And so these schisms, it's my business to keep track of the players. Nathan. <laughs> well, no, I, so I'd never heard of this Ken Hobbit. I watched the whole video. I, normally I, I can't stomach very much of it, but I was just, I was just amazed how he would move through topic to topic, making stuff up just, just mm-hmm. on, on the fly, just pure nonsense. And then, um, so I'm having lunch with Bob Trivers today and I don't know how this came, something came up and he goes, yeah, the only person I ever debated in public was Kent Hovind and I did it twice. And I said, really? Like, how Ooh, is this person? You, I'd love to get him on my show, Nathan. I hope Bob, you can arrange I'll say him. something to him. I'll say something to him. Boy, Boy I love to interact with yeah. people. There Hovind. have been ones who have had, had debates with Dwayne Gish or attended debates with Dwayne Gish. And a lot of this stuff isn't available in the public record because it was occurring so far back that nobody took records well, of it in that. So yeah, I, I want to have a chat with Bob. Because he said that he made a video, because right? Bob told him, he goes, I'll get, I'll go on stage with you, but you got to pay me like $1,000 for, and he said, okay. He goes, and then he put out this video and he was selling the video of the debate for like $100 and he was giving Bob nothing. So Bob wrote him and said, you, you owe me royalties from the video. So he was giving him, he gave him a couple of checks for the videos. But it seems to me that that Hovind, um, this he's a, a merch. He, he his whole thing is merchandising, right? And and the whole, it's a whole business enterprise. Oh, they all are. And all from, I know he went to jail. The, um, Hovind is yeah. Oh, a lot Hovind, of them. Uh, Ray Comfort yeah, yeah. does books and videos. Uh, we're doing the answers books. They re- revamp these things like every few years. All of them. All four of them. Just keep putting yeah, them out yeah. there. Even the one the one we're doing now, which technically has a 2007 a publication date on it, copyright date, but it's got masses of footnotes and references all the way up to 2016 and 2017. So it, it you can't even judge. They, they metastasize these things like dandelions in summer and uh, mm. try to make the mo- most out of it. So from a scholarly point of view, it's both a blessing and a curse because you've got multiple versions of the text and trying to pin out when it was actually written. Did it actually date to the publication date of the book or is it sufficiently revised that it actually has a more recent date to try to pin it down? Because the more recent the material is, the more they are overlooking for it. And so that's why from my scholarly methods point of view, I like to know the chronology of things. I'm a compulsive sequence builder. Yeah, well, it's just it's um, it, it's really mind blowing uh, because I had only heard the, the the creation science and and intelligent design stuff that I'd read had been either evolution news or um, I, I don't know I haven't read that much I did read um, Michael Behe's book though um, I mean it was a long time ago oh, which but, one the the old the old one or the newer one um, I read it in about. Uh, 2004 or five? Does that help? Oh, that would have to be a Darwin's black box because okay. he only did uh, oh, um, the uh, Edge of Evolution in 2007. And by the way, uh, if you get Evolution Slam Dunk, I will dismantle uh, his uh, uh, chloroquine argument in that at great length. That was particularly yeah. fun to do. He tried. He tried to use chloroquine resistance as a shoehorn to deny the entire reptile mammal transition specifically. Without discussing any other reptile mammal transition, it was a it was a neat trick, but you got to get your math straight first, Behe, and he didn't. <laughs> the one hmm. thing I'm trying to do 
And two, if you if you know any publishers and stuff or agents, you can get together with two to get me on to. Uh, when Christine Janis, um, you're familiar with her, the paleontologist. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Christine Janis, British paleontologist, mammal one. She had known about my work and had bought Evolution Slam Dunk. And um, uh, she just loved the thing, but said the one thing that it needed to be fully uh, gone for a, a college level analysis was it needed the illustrations. You want to be able to see the fossils. You mm -hmm. want to be able to see the charts from Science Magazine that show tracing the evolution of chloroquine resistance and all that. And I go, yeah, I'd love to do that. Uh, so I got a whole stack of material that I would be doing a, a revised second edition and uh, we'd want to get all the illustrations for that, and that would be a cute little puppy. So there's there's well, a a call out. Please, please, have, please, I need an agent. Have you had any contact with Behe? Hmm. Have you had any contact with with uh, Behe? Oh, uh, I Behe? wrote him quite or emailed him quite a few years ago. I mentioned some of it in my old tip work uh, on the, uh, relating to the firing line debate that he had with um, uh, Buckley back in the 1990s. He was one of their star witnesses. And it was all about whale evolution. And I wanted to contact him to whether he had ever done any research on whales since then. And it was painfully obvious that he hadn't. So he, he just he, he would just not do follow up on stuff. Uh, again, yeah. another biochemist. Um, he's got a, a, a specialized area. He got religion. He was already politically conservative. He fits all the profile exactly. But when you yeah. look at him at that source level, um, he, he stays so far away from stuff. The, the one he will respond to some critics and, and you've seen in the responses to you, this double down mode that happens with the, uh, intelligent designers. It, it, it's done relentlessly over in creationism too, but certainly the, the people of the discovery Institute are just anal retentive, dig in their heels, repeating the same thing wow. over and over again. Yes. And, uh, yes. Yeah. That's what anybody who wants to follow up on the links that I put up on the course description and have a good stomach available. You can read uh, the postings that Nathan has and then all the Discovery Institute stuff. And by all means, follow up. One of the ones, even even when they were responding to you, they were trotting out a source from 1908. <laughs> it's, it's baffling. It's absolutely baffling. And the, um, the, the biggest thing is that the, they, they want to find quibbles um, as like a, I guess they use that as like a, a wedge that they can find mm. into dismantle, but they totally miss the main point. So my, my, my point about external testicles that I tried to make is I wrote a, an article for Undark Magazine about how, um, you know, external testicles, you know, in yeah, a sense- I put the links up to that. Yeah, it's, it's a bizarre design and it certainly has some, some major drawbacks that internal testicles don't. And they, they kept going on and on, yeah, but they're out there because that's the optimal temperature. I said, well, that's because it evolved that way. I mean, enzymes can evolve a, a, a range of optimal adapt temperatures. adapt to the environment. <laughs> of course, and, and lots of animals have internal testicles and do just fine. Jackson and then the, an next article, the next article that they wrote about me said, Nathan Lentz doesn't understand refrigeration. I, I mean, <laughs> so they just... They just keep pounding this whole, no, it has to be colder. No, it has to be colder. That's just, and I'm like, what is, what is, is sperm development at 35 degrees Celsius, like a property of the universe, like the speed of light and it can't be changed. I mean, what? It, Thus, it yeah, it's, 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 it's in Genesis. They were talking about the temperature of testicles right in between uh, Genesis day one and Genesis day two. Jackson, you had a, a, a point to raise. Oh, I have a question for you. Uh, are you a supporter of the uh, Pegasoferi or the Scrotifera hypothesis for uh, Laurasiatherians? Um, so, I, I you were talking about the external scrotum, so I, I, that came to my mind. Geek yeah. alert! Right, yeah. <laughs> so I would say, and I forget which one this is, but the I would say that the uh, testicles, the male gonads, left to escape the warming abdomen during the mammal transition. So which, which camp does that put me in? Uh, there's more of the scrotifera hypothesis focuses on the external testicles than the uh, pegasoferi. Yeah, so how yeah, far that's, back, that's okay. How I don't far remember back do you think that went, went but, Nathan? What's that? How far back in the mammal transition uh, uh, the, do you think that went? I don't think it we know. Before? I don't think we know at all. But, yeah. but in, yeah. the, um, it was definitely before the like the placental uh, marsupial split, right? Um, because the marsupials, I think they all have internal testicles. Is that right? Oh, I don't know. Exactly. I know elephants. It's like elephants have also developed. You know what? I'm gonna yeah. look it up. There's circumstantial evidence and, that and... 
hair is starting to show up uh, in the, the synapsid line in the Permian way before it shows up as actual fossils. In fact, that was one of the little data blips that Christine Janis had said, ooh, I didn't know that. Uh, it was yeah. in a kind of an obscure technical journal. Yeah, and, no, I would think uh, that so would be that later that than that. But... Theoretically, be a measure of changing metabolism and thermal issues that could bear Well, that's on that what point. I was wondering is that what, what's the earliest time that you're thinking that endothermy developed in that, in that lineage? Yeah, that's the, I, I think that given the range that we can see, I think one of the things that's gonna be most interesting outlier measurements is crocodiles because there's ever evidence that crocodiles have undergone a kind of hunkering down that they were much more biologically active back in the Mesozoic than they are now. They have a almost fully developed four chamber heart and there's a whole bunch of stuff going on. The ones we're looking at are the kind of drab specialized uh, remnants of it. Mm -hmm. And so that I think being because crocodiles are still in existence, they're going to be able to look through the gene systems and as paleogenomics, another little buzzword that I like to throw out against creationists, you know, they're retro engineering this stuff now, gang, uh, that that's going to actually provide lessons and also the bird lineage to try to figure out because there you've got that diapsid bit, multiple tracks on there, and then you've got the actual mammal stuff and they can deal with retro engineering things in terms of isotope balances that they can find in in the uh, bones to determine what kind of, of of diets and stuff they were doing with and that and so uh, there's there's potentially fabulous amount of inferential science that's lurking out there and hopefully yeah. 10, 10 years from now we'll know more about it right and it'll solve a lot of the problems that we have that have come about through convergent evolution so the, you know from the four chambered heart to endothermy these things these things yeah. evolved more than once and that confuses us, and we're using our, our own methods correctly, but you know, parsimony and likelihood um, mm -hmm. sometimes yeah. conflict and we just don't have all the information. And what's interesting to me, if you, if you compare that approach to the creationist approach, is that they, they love it when we change our mind about something because it shows that we were wrong before. No, it doesn't. We are circling in on the truth. Every, yeah, we're every getting better day data day. field. That's another yeah. measurement that I'm doing in the TIP project is because I'm looking at how many sources, total they've, uh, they've cited about 4,000 technical papers in all of the anti-evolution material I've processed so far. And that's against my data field of 25,000. And I do not for yeah. a moment think that I've got the whole data field out there. Right, no, so uh, yeah. <laughs> they're bumping into about a 15% of my data field but a big chunk of their material is just authority quotes and selective material and older stuff. So as a well, rough they heuristic- they their own sources all the time. Yeah, my, my rough heuristic is that anti-evolutionists are missing 90% of the data field. Mm -hmm. And so we can throw that one out as that whenever they say, uh, well, we pay attention to the same data, but we just have a different hypothesis. And I go, no, you don't pay attention to the same data. You're paying attention, to, you're missing most of the data field and you yeah. can't account for it. Uh, that's why I like throwing the reptile mammal transition. The reason why I wrote the book is because there wasn't a good accounting of this. There was some criticism of Dwayne Gish way back in the 1980s, and you have a little smattering of it popping up. Prothero has it in his paleontology book and that, but not in relation to how anti-evolutionists deal with it. So I went through and went analyzed not only what the data field was, but all examples of anti-evolutionists who had bumped into the reptile mammal transition. There's only about 20 of them. And it includes all the poobahs at the Discovery Institute. Uh, in fact, Christine Janice's favorite section of the book was when I dis dismantled uh, Bill Dembski and Jonathan Wells's design of life. She just adored that part. She uh, because <laughs> I was just it. It was such a lame retread of the uh, uh, pandas and people book, which itself filters all the way back into creationism. And in the in a re if I can do a revision of it. Uh, I, I bumped into Jonathan Wells when he was lecturing at a uh, uh, intelligent design coffee clutch that was going on at a conservative college over there in uh, Seattle. And uh, I asked him point blank, how much of design of life did he contribute to on this reptile mammal trans transition issue? Because he was kind of the fossil geek, whereas Dembski has never shown an interest in it. And to my amazement, he said he contributed nothing. So everything that was going wrong with that bit was coming from Bill Dembski not doing the research. And remember, Ann Coulter, when she wrote her anti-evolution stuff, she was relying on Bill Dembski. So there I've got the circles netted. Yeah. <laughs> Scholarship is a contact sport, Nathan. <laughs> Mark right, right, right. Right. But it, it seems. What's that? I think they're exterior. 
Oh, oh, for oh Jackson was looking at uh, exterior marsupials. Uh, the marsupials are, and the monotremes too, are absolutely they, fascinating. Yeah. One of the things that I uncovered in the in researching for uh, Slam Dunk was how the reason why part of the things that develop why uh, the platypus has no teeth has to do mm -hmm. with the fact that it it was living in a very murky environment and its diet didn't require seeing easily. But that electro sensing that was developing was really important. And the, the wiring that goes up above the jaw was crowding out the tooth roots. So there was a selection pressure to just get rid of the damn teeth so that there was more room for that electro sensing neurons that's going up, connecting up into the brain. And so the, the stuff that, that connects up to why early monotremes had teeth, but the later ones to the platypuses don't, ah, it, it's just exquisite. The science is so effing fun. Yeah, yeah that is amazing. I didn't know that. I didn't know that. Yeah, so, yeah, I, I collected I together a pile of interesting stuff uh, that I was, and of course, so much of the genetics that's working on. Uh, I mean, uh, the paleogenomics issue I really love to hit on because boy, our anti evolution is behind the curve on this one. Uh, we've now, uh, in the directly with the reptile mammal transition, God, I can't remember whether the name is Meredith or, or uh, I think it's Meredith's paper. Anyway, um, where they retro engineered uh, uh, rat teeth to work out. What, there was only a couple gene clusters that were used to generate all the different morphologies of, of tooth cusps. And they included the ones from one of the extinct groups of the reptile mammal transition. So they're literally figuring out the gene mutations required to generate the tooth forms in a now extinct form of life that existed 200 million years ago. Or no, 100, 100, 115 million years ago. Now that's pretty damn good. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> I am also well, having we're past the hour on here, and I imagine Nathan, you, you got in bit off more than you could chew for uh, uh, bumping into the uh, evolution hour. But gee, what, I'm glad you. Know, you there's up. one 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 thing that I've never heard, and mm -hmm. you would know this hopefully. I've never heard anybody at the DI or anybody respond to the issue of pseudogenes and their place in the genome. They, I mean, they have a lot of sweeping statements about. Uh, junk DNA and and and, and anytime anybody finds a, t a tiny little function or purpose for something that we previously thought wasn't, they freak out. But I want to know what they what they think about pseudogenes. That's what I'd love. Their to know. their doctrinal position, and this is especially true for the intelligent design movement. They are stuck with the idea that all pseudogenes are ultimately functional. They do something in the genome because it really doesn't like the idea of God littering things with stuff that yeah. doesn't do stuff. So they encode project, they just <laughs> auger in on that one uh, relentlessly. The There's a bit of that also going on over in the creation science side. The, the, the thing that I love waving uh, in addition to the reptile mammal transition in my Twitter jousts and stuff is ALU, ALU. 10% of the human genome is the ALU retrotransposon. There are a million and a half copies of the little bastards and they're breeding yeah. like, and, and the vast majority of them not only don't do anything. If you look at Jonathan Wells, uh, are you familiar with his junk DNA book? No, I, I, mean, uh, I you know you're John not Wells missing is. anything. But yeah. anyway, it's a relatively short thing. It's only like 100 pages long or so. It's not very impressive. But the what I, I, I discussed it in, in the Slam Dunk because he mentions in passing the ALU retrotransposon. And he, he cites one paper and he's arguing, well, see, it does something. It's functional. Well, excuse is, me, I've been following that? this for years. There's a whole slew of functional ALUs. That's not the problem. It's that most of them aren't. And it's it's yeah. basically got a copy signal that replicates in the thing, but it has no start codon. And what you have yeah. to have is when the start codon mutates into a start codon, now it's being read. And the vast majority of cases are bad because it's showing up in the middle of a protein cluster or and screwing right, up the right. folding. So there's a bunch of diseases that occur. In the area where selection has worked effectively is that the, in the brain, ALUs are involved functionally and positively. But that doesn't mean all of them are. So I say, hey, Jonathan, you got yeah. one functional ALU. Now would you like dealing with the rest of the 1.4 million? <laughs> right, right, right. So, I mean, have you had Dan Grauer on your evolution hour? Uh, no, I'd love to though. Okay, because he, he he was on my podcast last year, um, and he talked about Alu, but he also talked about just his calculations in general about what percentage of the genome codes for anything, and he's really confident in his number of seventy-five percent non-functional DNA. 
Uh, that you, sounds about right. It, that, that, what it, my impression of the technical literature is the cell is as dull as a sack of hammers. It doesn't sounds, know what it's doing. It has the whole DNA and it processes a pile of it and generates the transcripts and they float around and some of them get picked up and turn into stuff. And then whatever is left over in the, in the, the floor gets cleaned up with the cleanup crew and then right. repeat. And that's basically what's going on. And ENCODE, all ENCODE was doing was measuring the transcriptions, not how much is being used in the biology. Yeah. Yeah. yeah no, I'm, I'm glad to know that I'm not sounding like an idiot on the biology front I, because I just have a BA in history. So I'm, I'm, uh, I'm no, not no, somebody with a you're sounding great. The, I, I was a postdoc at NYU when the ENCODE project was starting and our lab was signed up as one of the ENCODE labs. And I was on this project for about three weeks, and I said, this is based on a, a whole bunch of assumptions. We're gonna be spending a ton of time and money to get data that we have no idea how to interpret. I said, I, I don't want no, no part of this. And me and several other postdocs just left the project. And eventually our lab, this was after I left the lab, but the lab pulled out too and had no, no part of it. And sure enough, you know, and I lost touch with the project, but about five or six years later, they announced their big paper, um, saying all of this stuff, and sure enough, everybody that had knew anything about that project said that's all spurious trans transcription. And now you've confused yeah. a lot of people with this spurious transcription that we all. And, and not only that, some of the transcripts that they have might have been artifacts, actually. Um, yeah. and, so, and boy, the you know, Discovery Institute in process. particular is relentless. It's sailing on that Titanic. They will not give uh, an inch on it at whatsoever. Yeah, yeah, and so uh, it's one of the. Uh, they, they, there's an interesting difference that occurs, and they, uh, Jackson and I have dealt with it, and we're dealing with it in the new book, is that, that that you've got a different dynamic with young Earth creationists than you have with intelligent designers. Intelligent designers have disconnected themselves from that chronology problem, so they don't have to worry about stuff. They can accept billions of years. They can expect that the reptile mm -hmm. mammal transition uh, was occurring in the past, but not whether it was designed or not. They just don't think about it. But flood geology people have a different dynamic. They have the bottleneck of the ark to deal with. They have got yeah. to figure out what the created kinds were, how they converted into the fossils that we see in the in the flood, and also how those same kinds could convert into all the forms we see on life now. So they are forced into dealing with speciation and rapid speciation and wholesale blatant speciation at a level that the intelligent designers don't pay attention to. So all of that retro transposon and pseudogene issues, they can kind of distance in their head as a blob of, we don't want to think about that, but they're kind of forced into it uh, over in the young earth creationist side. So that's an interesting dynamic that's happening that, that a Jeffrey Tompkins or Georgia Purdom have to kind of skate into in a way that a Douglas Axe or a Michael Behe or a, a Jonathan Wells don't. But they have a they have a, an even tougher problem. They have a tougher problem because they also have to explain how the penguins got from Mount Ararat to Antarctica through the Arabian <laughs> Desert. <laughs> oh, oh, some of the, you're going to love some of this stuff because there's a difference between the upper echelon fact claimants and how they don't really think that through very well. Biogeography is kind of vague. And then you have people like Kurt Wise, who says that some of the things were being kept on, that the future coal forest, I'm not making this up, the future coal forests were actually colossal floating forests that occurred back in the pre-flood period, and that those were eventually sucked in and turned into the coal deposits during the flood. Now, this, the one I'm about to tell you has not been proposed by regular creationists. These are bottom feeders. But <laughs> one of the explanations that was given for how like koalas got to Australia is that they were ejecta as volcanic deposits were firing things into the air. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Face palm. It's from Conservapedia. Are you aware of that organization? Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Yes. And Conservapedia there too. Remember what Conservapedia is. Conservapedia it's is founded Schlafly's by son, uh, right? Schlafly, the son. Yeah, hmm? yeah I said Phyllis He's Schlafly. founded by the son, son of, of Phyllis Schlafly. So there yeah. is that culture camp conservative political worldview. You can't step more than one step away from any of these subject matter before you're bumping into this culture camp framework 
that then percolates upstream to Ben Carson, to Rick Perry, to Mike Pence. And should Brown you back. be scared as well get out about this? I am. Yeah, so there's uh, there's my uh, uh, approach to things. I knew this was going to be a damn good conversation, Nathan. This has been absolutely <laughs> delightful. Uh, I probably would have loved to have picked your brain more about the interactions that you might have had with the uh, intelligent design people, but I know that can ruin your digestion. And so I think all of the... The, all of the posts that I put on the linkages will handle that effectively. I'd really love to have Bob Trivers on and Grower and anybody else that's in this area to pick well, brains um, and connect up on stuff. I'm, I'm going to talk to Bob again soon because we're trying to get uh, one of his articles placed right now. But uh, Dan Grower, if you just look him up, he's at University of Houston. Just write him. He'll he'll. Oh, he'll okay. Join yeah, I'll let him know because I think I got a bunch of stuff on him in, in my bibliography. I'll check through on that. But yeah, I'll just you throw him out an I, email you can and say, say that I recommended. Hi. Yeah, you can say that yeah. I recommended him. He, he was very nice. And in fact, actually, he recorded my podcast interview before we even were out yet. Like he was like one of the first episodes, so he mm -hmm. was definitely willing to talk to me before he even knew who I was. So, yeah, um, what we got is I'm trying to build up a network of people who can interconnect data field on an unprecedented scale because I, I'm an old fart who has figured out how to use YouTubes and the like, but I am blown away how much technical literature is directly accessible to my little mouse thing because I'm a social security guy that's functionally string non-budget. So everything <laughs> I can get freebie is all the better. And that means that no creationist, no climate denier, no anti-vaxxer has any excuse not to be able to access the primary source data. And the only way they can give an excuse is if they're saying they're effing lazy. Right. Yeah. Okay, so I think we've we've beat the horse to death on this one quite nicely. Um, uh, I thank Nathan for being here. Um, Jackson, you didn't have a heck of a lot to say, but you were a nice little monitor. I'll just point out that Jackson and I are the ones that are writing the Anti-Answers book. Uh, we're plowing along on that one and having a hell of a lot of fun. We want to do to Answers in Genesis what we did to the Discovery Institute in Evolution Slam Dunk. Go and if it. you don't have my Evolution Slam Dunk book, get it because A, it's damn good, and B, I need the royalties. <laughs> so uh, both of those things are important. And uh, thank you, Nathan, uh, for being here. This was uh, an absolutely delightful show. We ran about an hour over and hope to have you on again. Any new developments that pop up in the work with Trivers, come on. You need a platform to talk about it. I'll sure. be delighted to because it's right up our alley. Stop oh, being yeah. the broadcast.